Rip rich piano feed is a to be complete for bedtime. But as they don't work anyway, why not have them interspersed with the regular workout in the morning? Four sets of 37 hammer curls, six pull-ups, 37 bent over DB rows, 12 horizontal pull-ups, 37 concentration curls. Audio during workout is Asimov, Bukowski, Celine, Cervantes, Dante, Dostoevsky, Bulgakov, Kant, David Graeber, Russo, Scott Fitzgerald. Audio of this video is from Kant's critique of pure reason with Rich Piana's anthem outbursts. Actual length of workout is two hours minus something. Perfect. Translated by J. M. D. Mikuljan. Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Human reason, in one sphere of its cognition, is called upon to consider questions which it cannot decline as they are presented by its own nature, but which it cannot answer as they transcend every faculty of the mind. It falls into this difficulty without any fault of its own. It begins with principles which cannot be dispensed with in the field of experience, and the truth and sufficiency of which are, at the same time, ensured by experience. With these principles, it rises, in obedience to the laws of its own nature, to ever higher and more remote conditions. But it quickly discovers that in this way its labors must remain ever incomplete, because new questions never cease to present themselves. And thus, it finds itself compelled to have recourse to principles which transcend the region of experience, while they are regarded by common sense without distrust. It thus falls into confusion and contradictions, from which it conjectures the presence of latent errors which, however, it is unable to discover, because the principles it employs, transcending the limits of experience, cannot be tested by that criterion. The area of these endless contests is called metaphysic. Time was when she was the queen of all the sciences, and, if we take the will for the deed, she certainly deserved, so far as regards the high importance of her object matter, this title of honor. Now, it is the fashion of the time to... reign of anarchy, while the skeptics, like nomadic tribes who hate a permanent habitation and settled mode of living, attacked from time to time those who had organized themselves into civil communities. But their number was very happily small, and thus they could not entirely put a stop to the exertions of those who persisted in raising new edifices, although on no settled or uniform plan. In recent times, the hope dawned upon us of seeing those disputes settled, and the legitimacy of her claims established by a kind of physiology of the human understanding, that of the celebrated Locke. But it was found that, although it was affirmed that this so-called queen could not refer her descent to any higher source than that of common experience, a circumstance which necessarily brought suspicion on her claims, as this genealogy was incorrect, she persisted in the advancement of her claims to sovereignty. Thus, metaphysics necessarily fell back into the antiquated and rotten constitution of dogmatism, and again became obnoxious to the contempt from which efforts had been made to save it. At present, as all methods according to the general persuasion have been tried in vain, there reigns naught but weariness and complete indifferentism the mother of chaos and night in the scientific world, but at the same time the source of, or at least the prelude to, the recreation and reinstallation of
At the same time, this indifference, which has arisen in the world of science, and which relates to that kind of knowledge which we should wish to see destroyed the last, is a phenomena that well deserves our attention and reflection. It is plainly not the effect of the levity, but of the mature judgment of the age, which refuses to be any longer entertained with illusory knowledge. It is, in fact, a call to reason, again to undertake the most laborious of all tasks, that of self-examination, and to establish a tribunal which may secure it in its well-grounded claims, while it pronounces against all baseless assumptions and pretensions, not in an arbitrary manner, but according to its own eternal and unchangeable laws. This tribunal is nothing less than the critical investigation of pure reason. I do not mean by this a criticism of books and systems, but a critical inquiry into the faculty of reason, with reference to the cognitions to which it strives to attain without the aid of experience. In other words, the solution of the question regarding the possibility or impossibility of metaphysics, and the determination of the origin as well as of the extent and limits of this science. All this must be done on the basis of principles. The path, the only one now remaining, has been entered upon by me, and I flatter myself that I have in this way discovered the cause of, and consequently the mode of removing, all the errors which have hitherto set reason at variance with itself, in the sphere of non-empirical thought. I have not returned an evasive answer to the questions of reason by alleging the inability and limitation of the faculties of the mind. I have, on the contrary, examined them completely in the light of principles. In the case of the others. While I say this, I think I see upon the countenance of the reader signs of dissatisfaction mingled with contempt when he hears declarations which sound so boastful and extravagant, and yet they are beyond comparison more moderate than those advanced by the commonest author of the commonest philosophical program, in which the dogmatist professes to demonstrate the simple nature of the soul or the necessity of a primal being. Such a dogmatist promises to extend human knowledge beyond the limits of possible experience, while I humbly confess that this is completely beyond my power. Instead of any such attempt, I confine myself to the examination of reason alone and its pure thought, and I do not need to seek far for the sum total of its cognition, because it has its seat in my own mind. Besides, Common logic presents me with a complete and systematic catalogue of all the simple operations of reason. And it is my task to answer the question of how far reason can go without the material presented and the aid furnished by experience. So much for the completeness and thoroughness necessary in the execution of the present task. The aims set before us are not arbitrarily proposed, but are imposed upon us by the nature of cognition itself. The above remarks relate to the matter of a critical inquiry. As regards the form, there are two indispensable conditions which anyone who undertakes so difficult a
that it shall be held to be absolutely necessary. Much more is this the case with an attempt to determine all pure a priori cognition, and to furnish the standard, and consequently an example, of all apodictic, parentheses, philosophical, and parentheses, certitude. Whether I have succeeded in what I profess to do, it is for the reader to determine. It is the author's business merely to adduce grounds and reasons, without determining what influence these ought to have on the mind of his judges. But, lest anything he may have said may become the innocent cause of doubt in their minds, or tend to weaken the effect which his arguments might otherwise produce, he may be allowed to point out those passages which may occasion mistrust or difficulty, although these do not concern the main purpose of the present work. He does this solely with the view of removing from the mind of the reader any doubts which might affect his judgment of the work as a whole, and in regard to its ultimate aim. I know no investigations more necessary for a full insight into the nature of the faculty which we call understanding, and at the same time for the determination of the rules and limits of its use, than those undertaken in the second chapter of the Transcendental Analytic, under the title of Deduction of the Pure Conceptions of the Understanding. And they have cost me by far the greatest labor, labor which, I hope, will not remain uncompensated. The view there taken, which goes somewhat deeply into the subject, has two sides. The one relates to the objects of the pure understanding, and is intended to demonstrate and to render comprehensible the objective validity of its a priori conceptions. And it forms, for this reason, an essential part of the critique. does not produce in his mind the conviction of its certitude at which I aimed, the objective deduction, with which alone the present work is properly concerned, is in every respect satisfactory. As regards clearness, the reader has a right